the guava, an agricultural treasure. We find ourselves at the guava plantation, Pisidium guajava. This crop requires soil with pH levels that go from 5.5 to 6.5. It can easily adapt to heights that are between 800 and 1500 meters above sea level. It's not demanding when it comes to water, although it does require water to be evenly distributed throughout its cycle. It needs six to six and a half hours of light. In order to obtain high-quality fruit, as well as commercial demand, it's necessary to carry out excellent farming practices. Let's find out what the guava fruit cycle of production is, and also the necessary care that must be given in order to attain a successful crop. In order to expand the crop, you first need to choose a great quality fruit tree. In that case, you graft an ICA1 pattern in the shape of a pear, a guava pear. You then extract the fruit and plant them in trays of 128 openings by depositing two seeds in each one. It usually takes 12 to 20 days for the fruit to germinate. At day 20 or 25 after germination, the plants are then replanted into bags with measurements of 30 centimeters deep and with a diameter of 8 to 10 centimeters long. The substrate that is used is soil and rice husk with a 2 to 1 ratio, previously treated with disinfectant in order to prevent pathogens from attacking the plant. After approximately two and a half months, the plant should already be poised with a height of around 40 centimeters, an optimum height in which to carry out the grafting. In order to do the graft, one must make sure that that area of the plant, which is around 30 centimeters big, that the stem isn't too woody nor too unripe, but with a cinnamon color. This is the ideal state in which to perform a graft. We're going to proceed in looking for buds that are in optimum conditions in order to do the graft, because not all the shoots have the buds we need to do the graft. When you do a graft, you try and make sure that the plant you're grafting is healthy, one that has shown throughout its productive cycle good conditions for production as well as excellent quality fruit of a good size. It's necessary for the plants that are being extracted to have at least three or four internodes in good condition. The graft made on the guava is a spatula-type graft, so the treetop is shaped this way, making a bezel-type incision so that the pattern may be introduced and secured. This is one of the most commonly used grafts, one of the easiest, one which has shown here good results with the plants we have spread. After grafting, you tie it and bag it in order to generate a kind of microclimate, as well as protect it from water, therefore avoiding the graft from spoiling. The plant then heads out to the field after four months' time, where it will then be ready to be replanted. Once the plant is ready to be replanted, the process that must be carried out before is making sure to find the right place, which is why the lot must be traced. Depending on the lay of the land, you either plant in a rectangular or triangular shape, this all depending on the topographical conditions. To plant in a square, it's enough just to do a trace using string, 
and wherever the strands cross each other will be the place to plant the tree. The average distances are either 6x5 or 6x6, so that the plant can have enough space to properly develop its top. The next step is the digging of the hole. This is done with a shovel with which you dig a hole that is 20 centimeters wide by 30 to 35 centimeters deep. The plant is then placed into the hole, is covered and stepped on. After the process is finished, you place a plank to one side and tie a stake to the plant. You tie it to the plank to prevent the wind from breaking the stem, which at this point is still very weak. After replanting the tree, you must start pruning labors, such as phytosanitary pruning and formation pruning. Phytosanitary pruning consists of eliminating all the dry and diseased branches from the plant. Remove all the dry branches from the tree because they harm the tree, filling it up with moss and vines of all types. Here we have a vine that sucks away at the sap. We should also eliminate all the parasitic plants that attach themselves to the tree because they bring no benefit and absorb all the nutrients. Look here, this part is already dry. This is a control pruning that we're giving the tree. These affect the tree because it sucks at the sap, therefore not allowing for the tree to fully develop. It just sucks at the sap, so we must eliminate all the dried up branches and moss. These types of moss are also harmful because it sucks away at the tree's sap and if you allow this to spread, it will damage the tree. The third pruning that takes place is the formation pruning. This pruning is carried out in order to facilitate all the labors that will take place in the future, such as harvesting and fumigations. See, here we're doing a formation pruning so that the tree is kept structured and uniform, making sure one side isn't heavier than the other or that one branch isn't much longer than the others. So we're making sure we get that uniformity. That's the key to formation pruning. Another important job, and one that is carried out during this time and throughout the cultivation of the crop, is irrigation. Even though the crop isn't very demanding with water, land filling is the time the crop demands the most quantity of water, since that is how the nutrients are distributed in order to make sure the fruit becomes a good size. Fertilization takes place at three different times, at 10, 45, and then 110 days after pruning. The materials used for this process are calcium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, potassium sulfate, and DAP. This process is carried out by digging a hole at a distance of 1.3 meters from the trunk of the tree. Fertilization helps with the development of the foliage and of the roots. The main pests affecting this crop are mites, bean leaf webworm, roundworm, and weevil. There are two types of mites. The Areophyte mite is in charge of damaging the crown, scratching along as they suck out the sap, preventing further development. The white mite scratches the fruit that is 2 to 4 centimeters in diameter, which leads to the loss of the fruit due to its poor quality once harvest time arrives. 
Thirdly, we have the ringworms. The ringworms attack the roots directly. They prevent the plant from absorbing the nutrients, therefore causing the leaves to fall, as well as turning them a copper red. They also produce chlorosis, ultimately causing the death of the plant. In fourth place, we have the weevil, a pest that harms the fruit or lays eggs on top of it. When the egg hatches, the larva starts eating the fruit on the inside. Afterwards, the larva comes out and finishes its cycle on the ground. Lastly, we have the bean leaf webworm. It is responsible for sticking the leaves on the crown together, the tenderest leaves. While it does this, it eats the foliage and prevents the plant from having an optimum development. Mite control takes place at day 10, day 20, and day 30 after pruning, all this in order to cut off their cycle. The products that are used are based on abamectin and sulfur. For the control of the weevil, fumigations using entomopathogenic fungi, metarhizium and Bovaria bassiana are carried out. The Bovaria is directed at the foliage and the metarhizium is directed at the ground in order to control the pupae, larvae and adults located there. The applications that are carried out for the bean leaf webworm are done before the monitoring. These are done using products based on active ingredients such as chlorpyrifos. Finally, after a long process of production within the crop, manpower from men and women from the countryside is needed, allowing for the agricultural wealth of the country to grow day by day. Exploring the different regions of Colombia allows us to discover remarkable places, filled with a natural wealth, much of it still undiscovered to cultivate and receive from the earth so many benefits and foods makes the countryside a magical place, worthy of recognizing and valuing.